So the other day, I was, I was thinking about dating apps, right? And I was wondering how they were getting on. And it turns out that they are not doing great. Bumble's actually down uh, 92% since it first went public. Yes. And Match Group, the company which owns basically every other dating app, is doing pretty badly as well. People are falling out of love with dating apps. And this is affecting Gen Z in particular, who are becoming less likely to spend money on the apps. In fact, Forbes Health ran a survey and found that 79% of Gen Z respondents said report experiencing some form of dating app burnout. You might have even... Yeah, but Gen Z is pretty cursed because they... They never knew anything else. It is the primary and possibly the only way the romantic game can be played, which is not so great. For anyone else, it's just uh, dating apps are just something that you probably don't like. Even seen that the companies have resorted to some, some interesting marketing techniques. For example, Bumble got in trouble for some ads that they ran trying to convince women to, to no longer be celibate, I guess. <laughs> you know full well about celibacy is not the answer. Thou shalt not give up on dating and become a nun. Uh, okay. Go fuck a guy today. <laughs> People weren't too happy with these adverts. Now, this is a far cry from the promise that dating apps made for us. When they first launched, it would be difficult to believe that around a decade later, they'd be launching $500 a month membership programs. If we try to understand how we ended up here, we maybe... I mean, the dating apps have a fundamental agency problem. Their incentive is to keep you on them. And your incentive, assuming you want a partner, is to leave as soon as you can. Maybe you can come to some interesting conclusions, not just about these apps, but maybe about human relationships more broadly and the assumptions that we might make about each other. The first thing that's worth explaining is that the, the decline of these apps is in large part uh, a signal of broader trends in technology. There's this idea of entification, the phenomenon of online platforms degrading the quality of their... Essentially, even if you are not someone who would enjoy a platform, they would try to make it a Skinner box for you that you become someone who enjoys it, or at least cannot escape it. Entification? their services over time, leading to an overall decline in user satisfaction and overall value. This is something that's really broad across. Hmm. That, it kind of depends on what, because like, does Wikipedia get worse? So it depends on what, so. Broad across technology. It is best characterized through Airbnb, starting initially as a, as a promised land where you could rent out a spare room at the fraction of the cost of a hotel, but ending up in a situation where people are paying $200 cleaning fees and have curfews and service fees for a rental. The most egregious example of entification is BMW, who in 2022 launched a subscription to just unlock the heated seats that were already in the car. Dating I mean, I hate to say this because people might not like hearing this, but this is a capitalism problem. The more leverage, the more power people have, the more they try to abuse that power for financial gain or for personal gain. That's it. Dating apps are not immune to this problem as fundamentally they are technology companies. The and they are highly incentivized to. And if it's a company where multiple people own it, then they basically have to be a complete ruthless psychopath who will stop at nothing to make one extra buck. The most obvious manifestation of this entification is the idea that subscriptions are king. I don't know if you know this, but Tinder actually has three separate subscription options on top of the $500 a month subscription plan. These look more like insurance plans than dating apps. Dating apps have not become immune from this subscription mania. And their monetization strategy has led to them feeling more uh, more like a gacha game. If you, if you don't know what a gacha game is, uh, it's a game that uses like a loot box mechanic where players buy in-game currency and use it to gamble effectively. In fact, Tinder actually ruled out its own in-app currency that you could use to buy special features that would increase your chance of finding love. It's a, it's a very overt shift that would increase your Yeah. But this means that for a regular user, you are completely wasting your time. Because you, if others are paying, which they are, then you are completely wasting your time, even more than before. Increase your chance of finding love. It's a, it's a very overt shift towards gamification, towards implementing game-like mechanics in a non-gaming environment. Uh, the literal CEO of the parent company of Tinder is a man named Bernard Kim, who was the former president of Zynga. If you don't know who Zynga are, they are the company that is responsible for all of the worst mobile games. You know, the ones that look like this, right? And it's no surprise that these mechanics have been transferred yeah. directly from mobile games, which are some of the most addictive games in the world, to dating apps. Yeah. I, I gotta say that I'm not super happy with the gaming industry, just pulling out every trick in the book to make the most addicting Skinner games. Skinner boxes, right? And uh, yeah, there are okay games out there, no doubt, but the gaming industry is a bit sketch. This idea of gamification, broadly put, is simply just dr driving engagement and driving usership, not by providing a service, but by hijacking your brain's reward circuitry and making you addicted to the app rather than enjoying the app. As these apps have become increasingly gamified, people have responded much how they would respond to an actual game by trying to, to exploit the mechanics of the game. In the world of dating, this manifests as hinge hacks. So this is whole world on TikTok, which I didn't know about, of people sharing techniques and tips that you can use to make your experience of using dating apps a little better. Some of these things include refreshing your hinge feed by threatening mm -hmm. to delete your account, which... I mean, one thing you can think back on is that... Imagine, like, all the games that you've played, like, which one you are kind of thinking fondly of because there are going to be games that you addic you were addicted to and games that you you really enjoyed even if you may have played it for like i don't know dozens of hours that's it but then you played another game for like thousands of hours but uh you're not really thinking back fondly
which supposedly flags Hinge, it makes you way more likely to show up in other people's feed. Uh, other people's decisions have been things like choosing to use AI wingmen to create a profile that is optimized for these algorithms. And certification. I, I wonder if uh, the AI girlfriends are kind of biting into this, biting into their, uh, <laughs> their profits. Also, if you need to do any of this, uh, that is just decide to leave the platform isn't necessarily a complete explanation though because despite the fact that many other services in technology have been getting worse and worse the companies seem to still be doing great and there are some, some unique dynamics of these apps that make them especially prone to collapse and that can help us understand the, the mass exodus part of it is simply the fact that these apps promote the idea that they'll literally change your life hinge for example markets itself as the dating app designed to be deleted which is an extremely big promise and also direct direct opposition to their incentive uh, it's a promise that i personally as a cynic feel like uh, isn't necessarily true hinge is this guy's a cynic i knew i liked him by a $9 billion company, so you know, I don't think they want you to delete any of their apps. I should mention that I try to consult a variety of sources, and sometimes that leads you, especially with dating, down some, uh, some uncomfortable rabbit holes, and so I want to maybe, maybe address a few preconceptions that people can often have after having had a bad experience with dating apps. They're not an enjoyable experience for anyone, regardless of gender identity. Around 8% of women report feeling some level of burnout, and around 74% of males report feeling some kind of burnout. Well, based on that stats, just stay away. Well, the unenjoyable experience is pretty evenly split across the aisle. We have some very different problems that occur, but no set of problems is one more significant than the other. Uh, interestingly enough, men outnumber women three to one on Bumble and Tinder, and yet women report higher rates of negative experiences. That's not to invalidate the fact that men obviously have incredibly high rates of negative experiences, but rather to emphasize the fact that nobody enjoys the experience of dating apps. The grass isn't greener on, on any one side. Men are far more likely to experience feelings of rejection, feelings of being ignored, whereas it seems like the issues that women report are more, well, they're different, they're different at least, right? So I would say that's a good thing, because let's say you go on a dating app, and you do your, I don't know, 50 right swipey and you get no attention because others are paying to even promote to, to be even promoted. And you probably don't look like a million bucks. So at that point, you're just sitting there and you, you got nothing. Maybe maybe you got like a few likes on you, but like the um, but they were, it was not like a mutual match. I'm like, okay, what are you gonna do? I guess you're just gonna leave. And uh, that's it. And you don't realize it then, but you have one life. Instead of spending, like, I don't know, untold hours just uh, right swiping there. So a 2023 survey found that over half of women under 50 who'd used dating apps had been sent a sexually explicit message that they didn't ask for, which I think is an insanely high statistic. Yeah, I mean, that's fair enough, but, like, you're kind of on, on a certain platform. I, I've been on Reddit before, like, I received some messages I did not ask for. But generally, the issues that lead people to feel burnt out are more broadly the, the failure to find a good connection, being ghosted, being lied to, feeling rejected, and having boring or not substantive conversations. Now, let's let's maybe understand a bit more about the, the user experience and what kind of leads to these super high rates of dis dissatisfaction, and whether dating apps are actually benefiting from this or not, because it seems like they aren't benefiting from this huge level of dissatisfaction that people are experiencing. I want to explain a little term from economics called adverse selection. Planet Money wrote a little piece explaining how adverse selection might be an important factor in understanding why dating apps have got. I mean, the fundamental problem with dating apps that I, I kind of debated making one, but aside Apart from like possibly making some niche ones like oh vegan uh, dating app or like oh yeah only people with master's degree dating app, which would really struggle to get users in the first place. I mean the fundamental problem is not of of software but of humans, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Unless I could make a dating app that kind of like changes people to to be like ideal people for others for those who are like seeking but even then i would just be playing against the dating app uh, i would just try to get people off the dating app so no it just it just fundamentally doesn't work the incentives don't align it's gotten so bad lately it's possible that dating apps face adverse selection basically a new app starts up and hopeless romantics looking for real love begin flocking to it but so do sleazy types who lie on their dating profile over time the earnest daters go on a bunch of bad dates encountering people who have no interest in real relationships or whose profiles are completely misleading like lemons driving good cars out of the used car market maybe sleazeballs push great catches out of dating apps and ultimately ruin the quality of the whole app experience so people go to a new app in the hopes of finding something better and the cycle starts again this idea of adverse selection is basically the idea that people can take advantage of you know the meta on dating app to promote themselves as something they're not and ultimately lead honest well-intentioned users to feel like the apps don't have any other honest users because they're only interacting with people who know how to game the app this is this whole idea of you know hinge hacks or using ai tools to, to beat the system it doesn't necessarily make you a better person on a date but it makes you more representative of what the market supposedly looks like to someone who's just downloaded the app and it makes people who download the app feel like everyone is awful there is a way to actually minimize these bad apples this is something that's actually been done before if you can give the yeah but like you're kind of implying that maybe like uh, there are better people on the on less popular dating apps but that might not be the case because suppose someone is enjoying a certain level of authority on on a dating app they probably want to stay there and those going to move who are not enjoying that so suppose like you were like a, a 10 out of 10 and like tinder really worked for you 
then you're probably still on Tinder and that's all you use. But if you struggle with Tinder that you downloaded like Bubble 2 and Hinge 2 and maybe like something else that I don't even know about, maybe you use other things too. So assuming that user who is kind of struggling more is would be considered not higher quality, then this doesn't really check out. The users as much information as you can, they can make more informed decisions, right? That's, that's intuitive. However, the more information you provide to those users, the harder it makes for the app to be gamified because they can't rely on the fact that you don't know things about other people. This is most clearly shown in the fact that Hinge's premium program, Hinge Plus and Hinge X, they both allow you to actually add more information about yourself. They allow you to filter your dates by location, by activity, and to fine tune exactly what you're looking for, which inevitably leads to a better dating experience and reduces this. Oh, will it? Okay. So this f filtering option was like a thing like, like 20 years ago on dating apps. So, uh, not dating apps, dating websites, I, I suppose. But when it comes to just people interacting with each other, they mostly just, uh, like, maybe read a line and, like, right swipe. It, it kind of encourages that, because uh, an interaction doesn't start. Only starts after, like, both parties agree to it. So you're kind of, like, incentivized to just do right swipe on people, and assuming an interaction is agreed to, then, then at that point you can kind of evaluate whether how much you like them, essentially. But it makes no sense to just uh, completely personalize and try to look hard for people who don't want to talk to you, I guess. This, this problem of adverse selection. And this isn't just theoretical. We can take the example of OkCupid, which has actually gone through a bit of a transformation from being a dating app that dealt with this problem of bad oh, yeah. apples a lot better than the new school of dating apps into gradually becoming another Tinder clone. I found this comment of someone who describes... <laughs> but I, I kind of dislike that because... Now you have a market where, like, let's say, like, one one, one guy is doing uh, something that works well, but the, the other guy is doing that, too. The, the third guy is doing the same thing. And it might seem like that they're all doing the things that works, but then you have no differentiation. And I hate that. And you might see this in games, that, you know, you have A game, and you have B game, and B game is so much more popular. So what A game does is they try to be more like B game. And what eventually does happen is that a game gets less popular because, like, they are they were serving some kind of a niche, I guess. Uh, so it's not necessarily a good strategy. Describe their experience, and I think it captures quite well what's going wrong with these apps. OkCupid used to be really great before they were sold off to Match. Match is the company that owns Tinder and Hinge and all of the other ones. It was a pretty simple concept that worked really well. Start people off by forcing them to answer, at minimum, like 25 matching questions around things like politics, religion, handling money, hygiene, etc. Core fact. Well, I never... I never knew about that. I'm not much of a dating app guy. Factors that people would consider when dating, essentially. But the kicker was that you also got to specify how you would like your potential match to respond to the same question. And you got to weight that response based on how much you cared about that particular question. After about 25 questions, you could always get a large enough sample size to, to match people, but it worked best at matching people that had answered over 100 questions each. It was like magic. Anyone with over an 80% match on that site always ended up being a surefire, amazing conversation. What this person is describing without necessarily realizing is this idea of adverse selection, right? The idea that just by having more and more information about who your potential matches are in terms of their interests, their likes, their personality, you can basically make dating apps be fantastic. However, the issue with that is that they can become a bit too good, right? And you end up in a situation where every person you match with is actually a pretty good person, and you're therefore extremely likely to, to quit the app. The ideal situation for these apps is this weird middle ground where they want you to find someone you like, but not too often and not someone that you like too much because then you delete the app. But they don't want you to have zero matches because that means that you'll delete the app super quickly. That's kind of the optimal model of a dating app. What's called the variable ratio reward where you get a reward at an Also, like, even if you reply to a question, let's say that you say that your politics are X. Like, do you want someone whose politics are X too? Necessarily? I guess it might make things easier. Yep. Sure. At an unpredictable interval, and you get a reward that's big enough every time to keep you chasing the next one, like a slot machine. And they're playing this like bouncing game, and they're clearly not doing a very good job at it. When it comes down to it, ultimately, mm -hmm. people want what they've always wanted, which is meaningful connection with others. And I think the real danger here is that people have been generalizing their experiences on dating apps as broader generalizations of how, you know, quote unquote, society is today. And I think that's a big problem because I would hope that most of us understand that, say, social media isn't necessarily a one to one representation of how people behave in real life. If you took Twitter posts, for example, to be the representation of how everyone behaves in general, you'd be scared to go outside. If you took Instagram real comments, you think everyone was incredibly racist all of the time. It's an algorithmic mirage. Yeah, exactly. It's an algorithmic mirage, right? These algorithms are so capable of building a mirage that makes you think that what they are showing you is simply a direct representation of what reality is when it's been filtered through layers and layers of algorithms and psychology in order to fundamentally change how you interact with it. The good thing that we can take home from this is that people are ultimately voting with their wallets, which is by far one of the most effective ways you can actually create change. There's a big trend, you might have seen it, of run clubs now. A lot of people are joining run clubs in order to find love. And this to me is, is ultimately a good thing. It means that people are actually choosing to create their own alternatives, which is exactly what we need right now. There's many, many angles you can approach this from, but ultimately the biggest reason they're doing so badly is that they're not providing the service that they promised. The collapse of dating apps doesn't mean the collapse of romantic love. It means that it's actually going to spread a bit more towards the places where it needs to be, towards these organic spaces. But then again, I'm also, I'm also incredibly, incredibly single, so you know, take my words with a grain of salt. <laughs>
leaving comments your best dating tip because what do I do?